You were talking about the, the videotape earlier, which is so interesting because both White Room and, and Mermaids share that kind of self representation that kind of occurs with a video aesthetic in, in it's like kind of the surveillance camera in, in Mermaids. But the kind of flights of fancy that occur in White Room, they have a deliberately uh, video aesthetic. They're 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 maybe more blue in their tint, but they also have under cranking or, or, or they're slowed down. Um, I'm wondering what, why that choice was made to have that those kind of imaginative moments have an aesthetic that was very self-referential, or at least referential to video at that mm. time. Well, <laughs> you could just be pointing to some weaknesses in the technology at the time, right? Because it's, you know, effects always look dated very quickly. You know, the, the state of the artifacts, Five years later, everybody's like snickering at, at how, how cheesy they look. So maybe it's just, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, but maybe they're just cheesy because they don't hold up. Um, but... Um, I don't think they're cheesy. No, but there's like a really video-y. Um, I'm trying to think of my reasons for it. I can't. I don't. It's like a hundred years ago. And one I, one and moment that I can maybe refer to specifically is kind of the the the, Mar the, the interview of Margot that they found on like a, a tape like that you would have. Oh, well, yes, that was definitely, yeah. that was definitely video. Yeah, no, I was, um, that was just the technology of the time, right? And it was a, um, and I love the, the grain and yeah, the dirt exactly. of it. Yeah, I love how dirty it is. It I'm, I'm, I'm really attracted to decay. In fact, I, I paint now and I... I'm, I've, got, I've been for years saying, oh, I wish a film didn't have to be so photographic all the time and so crisp and so clean, and I try to find ways to dirty it, but then it, you can really easily get uh, uh, stuck at the surface of the image if you play with it too much, yeah. and, it's, and it calls attention to the, the, physical, the physicality of it too much and takes away from what's going on, whereas with a photograph or a painting, that doesn't happen. But now I think the technology is actually there to keep it dirty. But that is one way, if you go into video and you use past technologies, then um, it, it could have this gorgeous, wacky grain and blown out highlights. And you know, it was really, um, it's just partly just pure aesthetic pleasure for me to do that. And it's partly, you know, I the story was that she was a watched person. She was a person who was all, all, you know, seen entirely, you know, like most famous people we know, we only know them through, uh, through technology. And so I really wanted to heighten that fact when we saw her. And when you move into Knight and even in Mansfield, there is that kind of formalism that still exists. And I'm, I'm curious how you balance the story, which is always very communicative, and then these kind of flights of, of formalism that kind of crop up every now and again on the film. Well, I write, I write the story partly just to justify those sequences. Oh, yeah. I really do. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I've gotten away from that, and I was just recently I thought, and I think, why am I doing just people in rooms? I used to do, you know, flying and walk on water. Why, like, what, what happened here? So I actually, f I'm going back. Well, that's great. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit more, um, I think of it as metaphoric, you know? Um, but uh, more, 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 and I guess another term would be magic realism, I, I suppose, but... I'm, I'm getting back to that. I was very focused on beauty for a while. I wanted every, I used to say, if, it, if, you, if, if, if this shot can't be played in a loop on your wall and be pleasing, then don't do that shot. Don't use it. Don't include it. Um, and then I started to think, oh my God, I'm getting like, like Vanity Fair or something. Yeah. Like I thought it was, it was getting too, look at me, um, you know, kind of vain. Um, that the films could, were starting to look vain. So I started to go towards really, really rough and raw, and I did this HBO thing that had no lighting. I didn't let any actors comb their hair. It, just, it was just, it was, you know, two cameras handheld. We didn't even have a tripod on the, on the truck. This is Tell Me? Uh, Tell Me You Love Me. And it was like, it was raw, rough yeah. looking, right? It was, and they wanted to shoot in HD, and I thought that would be too crisp, <laughs> and I sort of, really pushed 16 because I felt more Cassavetes and you know scenes from a marriage which was and at, you know Bergman that th those were the two kind of godfathers yeah, of yeah. it you know um 
So that looked really dirty, and it felt really real and raw, and you know, it felt very intimate. I didn't, I didn't want anything slick about it. And then I've, I've been working that way on a couple of things, and now I feel like, okay, it's natural. Like I know how to make it feel like you're just there and it's caught. That's the whole goal. And now if I can add the beauty onto it, then then we're singing, right? And yeah. I can make it look just sort of accidentally that beautiful. It would be great. Um, so yeah, I, I write stories that allow me good shots and yeah. sequences. I love sequences. Sometimes I think I'm just like a high-toned video, music video director because I'm really, really happy when it's just music and picture. Yeah. I'm really happy. Oh, I could play with that for days and cut it and recut it. And that's when and sometimes I, I wish I didn't have to make people have a story. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not entirely true, but my pure pleasure is just... If you were to say, Patricia, what do you want to work on right now? It would be music and um, image alone. Well, it's interesting because, especially with Night, it seems like the critical reaction was so focused on story that it kind of missed like the fact that the, the film begins and ends with these kind of lyrical, transformative, um, no dialogue moments that get no attention whatsoever. And even like the kind of slow motion shot of the dog at the end, like. Those are really great, beautiful moments in that film, and it's like they're also wedded to the story, but they don't get no one comments. On it's formally my most conservative movie, though. Yeah, right. There's no like framing device. No, yeah. There's no. It's just beginning to end. It's everybody's. You know, there's some crazy behavior putting a dog yeah. in a fridge or whatever, but it's not. You know, it's, and that was actually um, consciously. Um, uh, a compensation for the fact that it was a lesbian relationship and I wanted to just make it a really classical movie. I just wanted to make a kind of a classical two people from opposite sides of the tracks and they have this one, this barrier and they overcome it and they come together and they run off together. I mean, I wanted to make it a, a classical movie. So that, I, I didn't have much formal play. I didn't have, you know, dreams or kind of metaphoric flashes in someone's brain like yeah. in white room or um yeah so that but i can't help but play once you're there with a camera <laughs> and a hundred people who are willing to go along with you on this ride i can't resist uh, you know really playing so taking a conservative story to tell and maybe not as conservative story like a mode that is conservative to tell and not conservative story that's often seen as kind of the antithesis of what, you know, many people uh, advocate, even going back to like the Cahiers de Cinema in, in 68, like how the form has to be as radical as the story. But it's interesting when you mention that now, it seems like there is a radical aspect to take a conventional thing to tell an unconventional story. That's the thing. That's the, it, that's the subversion, yeah. right, is um, take something that... You know, the most most of the audience is going to have a little bit of reaction to it. this. Yeah. This is a long time ago, right? It's it, the world has entirely changed about, you know, sexuality. But the uh, at that time, like the ad for that movie was banned in the New York Times. Oh, really? It was banned. There was two women kissing, and it was close ups of their heads, and they were, uh, you know, like a, you know about to kiss, and on the same page. Um, I mean, no, I mean, at the same time, the same time of release was a Johnny Depp movie with him and a woman. Just ex it was like exactly the same ad, and that was fine. Yeah. So you know, I in my cheeky whatever, I wanted them to draw a mustache on one, <laughs> just draw it on French. the photograph, yeah. and then and then submit it again. But they wouldn't. They, they it wasn't allowed. We had to submit something a little less sexual, you know. Um, so it was a different time. So to take. Uh, a really easy form, and the colors were warm, the skin tones yeah. were warm. It was burgundy, and it was gold, and it was woods, and it was, you know, everything was warm and easy to digest, in a way. Um, so that, that was, uh, to, to, it was the sugar on the pill. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the liberties in Mansfield Park, did you notice the same kind of reaction because that's also kind of radical the way that you adjust the story and the, the process of adaptation. Right, well I guess I did think it was um, uh, a radical approach to an adaptation in general, which mm -hmm. is to take the author, to, 
to f facts about history. I mean, here's the fiction. And I took facts about history and about the author and put them into the fiction. Kind of like Naked Lunch, too. Yes, actually, yes. Um, and that, you know, some people just resisted in a huge way. And other people, very knowledgeable people about um, um, Austin, really respected it. So, you know, some people just hate adaptations, I think. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's that the only true adaptation would be if you filmed the page. Um, but I think people underestimate what a radical thing it is to do an adaptation. You know, there's, there's this faithful fetish thing that doesn't actually make sense because I think you, it's a profound change. It's like taking this glass and making it into a flame. You know, it's not, it, 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 it's a, it, you can't just take the story and put that story up on the screen and think that that is somehow faithful. I think it's actually unfaithful to sentences, to style of writing, to paragraph length, to just everything that is that is not just the story, you know? You know? So anyway, that, yeah, I, I got, um, um, you know, uh, a really interesting reaction. And I got a very political reaction to that film too. Is people, oh, really? Oh, yeah. The, um, the, in, the, in, in England, it was really interesting because the conservative newspapers would um, resist it and, you know, Time Out and The Independent and The Guardian liked it. Um, and, you know, the conservative was, would say, well, it's best to leave these things under the surface, like slavery. <laughs> like slavery, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, are you hearing yourself? <laughs> and it's like, of course you want to leave it under the surface. Um, and whereas, you know, the other ones said, isn't this great, we're, we're sort of showing the financial underpinning or the, uh, the financial foundation, uh, foundation to all our civility and yeah. graciousness. And um, so now it was fascinating. It was also fascinating to see the difference between England and um, America, in North America's response. There were jokes that flew in England and that didn't fly in Canada, I mean in Canada or U.S. It's very interesting thing, but um, I, it, it's so easy to be radical when you're dealing with Jane Austen. Like just doing handheld is considered outrageous, right? Because they somehow think that your images should look like the paintings of the day. For like, yeah. and why? Because yeah. I do handheld, and they say, "Oh goodness, are you sure about that?" Or I do a screamer close up or something or another, and they there was a shutter that would run through the. Audio, through the crew, I had a great crew, but they had done you know their period pieces, you know. Well, the heritage film were like dominated the eighties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're still very. There, I, there, I in uh, auditioned actor after actor who'd only ever been wearing frocks, <laughs> right? Who'd only ever had you know period wigs and bonnets. It's interesting that the actual the places where you diver, diver, uh, diverge from the the, the text. Are also formally the most kind of obvious, such as like the direct address to the camera for the letters, or um, the fact that I always do that. I'm so attracted to that. It's um, it's uh, Grey Gardens, the documentary. Yeah. So what attracted me? You probably heard me say that before, but yeah, that was the first time I saw anything like that, and I thought that's interesting. That's that's interesting. Even the 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 slavery mm. component, which is more of an addition, is the um, the slow motion shots during the the sketches or the conclusion, which is kind of this brava uh, camera movements. The slow motion during the the the, the um, when the sketches are revealed. Sketches was a, a, a kind of fixing a mistake. Oh really? <laughs> so people, maybe smarter people don't reveal that kind of stuff. But um, I, you know, it just it flew by too quickly. That moment didn't have the weight it needed. When I, when I shot it, I shot it, I, you know, we were really short of time that day, and I just shot it. And I was happy with the performance, it happened the way, but it just didn't have the weight it needed. Yeah. Yeah. So I needed to make it bigger. I needed to take that moment apart and, and lay it out more carefully. Let it deserve a bigger score, moment in the score, and it was really um, needed weight. That's so gravity. interesting you mentioned that because um, it's something that is not really in the text. Like The Affair, it seems that once it gets adapted into a film, you're able to kind of show and let it sit there 
those qualities that are in the original text are kind of passed by more through inference, like the news, like that the affair is revealed in the news. Yeah. It's not shown, but like when you adapt it, you get to show it, and you, like you say that the sketches needed to be on there more because of the weight. I found that to be a really interesting component to the, the adaptation to film. Well, that's joy of film, right? That's the, uh, you know who wrote a really beautiful piece about, is Michael Cunningham about yeah. the hour, hours. Did you read yeah. that? Is that beautiful, the way, what, it, what he talks about, what film mm -hmm. gave his story? Um, yeah, there's just details and flicks of the eye and gestures and, um, and, the more I do this, the more I think that what a director does is control emphasis. And, you know, I decide whether this cup is front and center of the shot or whether it's back and then, you know, where, where you put the camera or where you put things in relation to the camera is how you control emphasis. So, um, like, and I discovered that through writing something that I didn't direct. It was through Grey Gardens, yeah. because I would envision these scenes and I'd write them down and then hand it to the director and then something else entirely different would come across and I think, yeah, but the glass needs to be visible to the audience, it's not visible, but if you make it too, if you do a cutaway of the glass, like I had this little motif where um, a glass is um, uh, knocked over at the beginning when they're at their height and they're rich and the maid comes quickly, cleans it up. And then uh, halfway through, when they're at their sort of, or three quarters of the way through, and they're their desperate, desperate worst, it's knocked over and it's left there. And it's broken in a cat like so. Um, and then finally, just at the very end, a glass that's been lying there is just upright. Just tiniest, <laughs> tiniest little motif, right? He, he forgot it, uh, the director. Great director in a lot of ways, very, you know, um, but, uh, but that kind of little, tiny motif. Now you couldn't have a close-up of the glass because that would be screaming it and you couldn't have um, it too far back that you wouldn't notice. So where you place it in relation to the frame was, was what I realized I couldn't control by, in my writing. Well, I'm so happy you mentioned that because my question about Grey Gardens is it to me seems like it would be so frustrating to write an adaptation because when you're when you're performing that act you're also thinking visually and how this is going to turn into a film with the compositions it must be so hard to write the adaptation. And well, that was I don't call that an adaptation, actually. Well, I guess you would say it's a remake, technically, because it is a film that's being It's turned. not a remake, either. It's a remake of the documentary section. Sure, yeah, yeah, that's true. But even that isn't, because I went to the Maisel Brothers um, uh, uh, office in Harlem and um, looked at the outtakes, of the outtakes, because yeah, yeah. they made a movie of the outtakes, uh, the Beals of Grey Gardens and then I looked at the outtakes because what I was really curious about is do they are they performing is it action and then they go from this to this or was it just a continuous behavior that they happen to catch and do they repeat do they do a lot of takes did they you know so that so anyway we remade the documentary some of the kind of iconic parts of it and then also added yeah. some stuff that wasn't seen um, and then, yeah, just invented, really. I mean, invented from letters and journals and everything we could find, um, the, 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 the story up to the point of the documentary. So I don't know if you call it, I, I don't know what to call it. I, I really don't know what that is. Because it's not, is it a remake with docu, it's, I guess it's a biopic with remade documentary, yeah. documentary remake elements. Yeah, re intercut, A reimagined. No, but it's not. The documentary isn't reimagined because that's very that's, slavishly yeah. repeated, right? Anyway, so it's some new creature. Think of a name. So when you went there, where was that in the process of the Beals of Great Gardens? Was that already being conceived, like that this was going to be recut? Or? Oh, no, the Beals was done. Oh, okay, that was long okay. done already. Yeah. yeah, Beals was done. So I went and just saw the outtakes of I see the that. outtakes. Yeah. But anyway, um, so what's frustrating? Yes. Was it frustrating to do that? It's thrilling. I mean, basically, you're a young thing, but no, but you'll just find that, you know, you, you, it's exciting when you begin and you're allowed into the industry and someone dares, someone calls you a filmmaker and you dare to say, I'm a filmmaker, and then you do it again and it's this high and you do it again and it's this high and you do it again and it's that high. 
And then you, you, everything you have, you have to do everything just to stay alive and not you become bitter or bored or um, uh, just stay new to it. So I knew that engaging with that story yeah. would just keep me alive, and that I and to just write it was new to me too. That would keep me alive too. So no, it was it was very exciting and. He definitely directed it in different ways than I would in some things, but I'm mm, so sorry. I thought it was a legitimate yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, so, yeah. Um, it's uh, it was a new It was a new twist on what I do, but it really made me respect directing more. Actually, I was talking to Wally Shawn, who was in that kids, oh, yeah, kids yeah. movie yeah. I did, and um, I said, uh, it's funny, it's just writing makes me respect directing, because when you see it just all uh, cut together and it's not your, what you imagined at all, you think, oh, I'm so sorry. I just got an answer. Hi, I'm in the middle of an interview of being filmed answering my phone. <laughs> it's okay, I forgot to turn it off. I'll call you back. <laughs> That's me being obnoxious. Um, and I said, um, because then I saw an edited version of it, and I was so depressed. I just thought it's boring. Yeah, it's a boring movie. It's like I thought all the stuff I thought would be alive is dead. It's just dead. It's not. Doesn't catch you. Doesn't have that. And then. Uh, you know, I gave my notes, but they kept working and working and working. The studio HBO, they, they, that's the thing. They, they keep working and working and working on it. And I saw it and I had goosebumps. Yeah. And I was just, so I, you know, I went from thinking writing is everything to thinking, ooh, directing is really huge, to now I think it's all in the editing. So <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, no, it was a fascinating process.